Hey, Maria, can you hear me? Hi, Diana. Hi. How are you? I'm good. I'm just setting up the live streaming um, okay. setup. So we will be I live. To do that. Uh, sorry, what was that? I won't bother you. I just would like to get in there. I know. I, I think we're all good, actually. Um, yeah, how are you doing? Mm, not bad, thank you. Not bad. It's a beautiful day. I just went for a long bike ride. Um, where are you? I'm in Serbia with my family. I was supposed to travel to the US the week. Uh, well, yes, the, the, a couple of days before the pandemic was um, declared and I just decided to stay. Right. Um, felt, felt like it wasn't the best time to travel at that time, but um, yeah, so, so st staying safe and healthy. That is good. Um, yeah, it's getting a bit boring now. What's the lockdown <laughs> like there? Sorry, what was that? It, what's the lockdown like? Is it complete? So it is complete for people over 65. Um, and for the rest of the population, we are allowed to go out between 5 a.m. and 6 p.m. And uh, during the weekends, we usually have full curfew, 24 hours for everyone. Wow. Um, and and looks like the the lockdown will be finally loosening. It's our seventh week. Uh, feels feels very long. It's um, yeah, it is beginning to be rather rather long. Um, hi Diana, and, uh, it's Alex. I'm joining early just to make sure the connection's okay. Oh hi Alex. Hi, Alex. We're just naturally hi. about lockdown. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, do you want to check your screen and everything? Yeah, screen looks fine though. It says I can't start video because host has stopped it. Oh, that's, we have that issue every time and I can't figure out what's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, let, let me go back into the settings and try to tweak things. Okay. Yeah, I can't do my video, but I mean, I'm not too fussed about the video, but, but the screen share, can you do the screen share? That's the key bit. Uh, let me check just one second. Let me just open the relevant presentation. Okay, let's have a look. Um, okay, is that sharing? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. sharing. Yeah. Just, that's it. If you can go full screen on that. Yeah, so let's just make sure that works too. I've noticed PowerPoint doesn't always cope well with it. Ah, oh, look, it's so annoying when it does this. So, uh, well, maybe that's all right. Is that coming up? It's coming full for me. It looks perfect. I oh, really, it doesn't have all the sort of, because for me, it's surrounded by lots of little menus. No, no, it's, it's, it's perfect. Okay. And you can see it scrolling through the sides. Slightly. Yeah. Uh, Maria, you're, it's good with you. Yes, I see it. Um, Alex, I just tweaked some settings. Could you try your video now? Yep. Just let me come out of full screen. Mine won't start. I don't I'm care. Sharing. Start video. No, afraid still no, but it doesn't really matter. Sorry about that. Unless you guys yeah. mind. Hmm. What, so what will, um, I mean, obviously while I'm sharing the slides, that will be what people see on their screens. What happens after we finish the presentation? Sorry, what, what was your question? I, I missed that. After, so just, um, after the presentation is finished, what do people see on their screens? Just the normal. Usually we put up, um, we can either put up a sort of a, a, an intro slide or I suspect in your case, you wouldn't specifically be referring to any slides again. It no, not really. I mean, I can just share um, I can just, uh, this final slide. So it's just a sort of closing slide. Yeah, I think just leave that up. That will be perfect. Right. Um, and we'll leave that up. And then uh, because we won't have, you know, we've not got anyone's faces on. So that would be perfect. Thank you, Doug. Well, do you want me to just put this up as what people arrive to? Or do you want, do you have a title slide you want to use? Maria has some title slides for intro, so she'll put those up first. So I will stop sharing. The screen. Yes. Um, let's see. Um, since Azim will be doing the intro, I will let him guide the slides on our part. So um, let's give him a couple of more minutes and then we'll, we'll establish that. Hi, Simon. Simon is writing. <laughs> 
in the chat window. So Alex, the way the questions will be delivered is either through the chat uh, window or Q and A and Diana will be, Diana and Azim will be um, organizing them and, and you know sharing them with you. So you don't have to worry too much about reading what people are writing. Okay, uh, fine. In that case, I'll come out of the chat. Yeah. And I think, Alex, after, after your uh, initial presentation, Azim is going to ask the first uh, sort of question and then, and then I'll take it over. Um, so just so you know that. And yeah. Uh, yeah, it will all, I'm sure, go extremely smoothly. Fine, no problems. Great. Well, we've got a few people joining now, so that's good. How's your Earth Day, Alex? Uh, nice. I've already been out for a run, so I've actually been out in nature, which has been very nice. That is nice. I just went for a, my first time I went on my bicycle and I went down to, uh, up for my bike ride, I went down to kind of slightly into town. I went to Marylebone and up through King's Cross and back along the canal. Nice. Um, and it's interesting. I mean, there are some spots where there are a lot more people uh, and there's a lot of building going on everywhere still. Yeah. 
Okay, the briefing is uh, going to start, start shortly. It's uh, Azim Azar here. Good. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. <clears throat> it's uh, Azim Azar here. I'm the uh, founder of Exponential View. We are going to get our briefing started. Uh, it's uh, part of our Tackling Climate Change series. We're going to start in a couple of minutes, uh, normally just give attendees uh, a minute or two to file in. In the old days, the pre-COVID days, this was because people were often running from a previous meeting to get uh, from that meeting room to their desk. Um, I'm guessing in your uh, post-COVID days, uh, all you need to do is uh, get a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and sit at uh, wherever your computer or iPad uh, is. So I will give people uh, a minute or two just to settle in. And in the meantime, I've got this beautiful picture of our wonderful planet uh, in my background, although I appear to be drifting off into space because I'm wearing a black t-shirt today. Good, okay. We will be getting started shortly. Um, as you come in, please do use the chat um, section and uh, you can quickly introduce yourself. It's nice for people to know where you're from, what you're working on, uh, it's just very helpful. We tend to have a very, very diverse uh, attendee group here. We'll get started in a minute or two. Um, today's briefing will be led by uh, our senior advisor, uh, Diana Fox Carney. Uh, I'm just going to do the fun front bit. Uh, she gets to have all the real fun today. Uh, and of course, Alex Evans, who's our special guest today. We'll get started in a minute or so. While I wait, uh, if you're in, I think the Northern Hemisphere, you can also see your uh, night sky polluted with the dots of uh, Elon Musk's new Starlink uh, constellation satellite. So that's on my to-do list for tonight uh, to go out and take a look at them. Um, and welcome to Nathan uh, from Colorado and Mark uh, from London and Kate from Belgium, who's built, working on vaccine manufacturing. She tells us she has been busy. Uh, I can imagine it's probably been the busiest time in vaccine manufacturing for uh, yeah, 100 years. Nice to see you again, Elizabeth. Okay, now that we're at three minutes past, I think I will get started, um, get us going. There are other people watching on different parts of the live stream, um, uh, but we've got enough attendees now. So let me start with um, finding my Green. Here we go. Share. OK, so welcome to the state of the exponential briefing. This is number 26. These are a set of briefings that are generally provided for members of Exponential View, which is a newsletter that uh, uh, I've uh, set up. Um, this is a particular series called Tackling uh, the Climate Crisis. It is one in a series of um, several that we've already had and a few more coming up. Um, 
briefly the agenda today, uh, I'm just going to say a couple of things about Exponential View, then I'll hand over to our senior advisor, Diana Fox Carney, who has been kind enough to look after this climate crisis series, and she will then take you through the rest of the briefing. Um, as many of you will know, uh, Exponential View is a weekly newsletter, um, and we're aiming to try to explain the rapid changes in technology and how they affect our uh, society. A lot of that now has a COVID lens to it. So what I would say is that the, uh, the, the COVID crisis and our response to it has really magnified and accelerated a number of the key trends that were coming through both the climate crisis and the exponent, exponential technology change. Um, if you're an EV paid up member, you can always get the latest at exponentialview.co. Um, if you aren't, you can always sign up um, and we are supporting various sort of COVID charities uh, this month. Um, there are a couple of interesting things that you'll find um, in the chat, an essay on six scenarios for the post-pandemic world, and also my discussion with the president of Estonia on how, as a highly digital republic, they've navigated the COVID crisis. So with that, I'm going to hand over, or at least invite Diana to join me. Diana, are you, uh, are you around to chat? Uh, I am indeed, Azim. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome to everyone and happy Earth Day. I hope that uh, you're finding time to reflect on the state of the planet today in a way that perhaps isn't possible in busier times or well, not that it's not busy, but uh, we're not actually moving out of our homes in, on the whole. So as Azim said, um, I'm delighted to be hosting this event today. Right here, you can see a couple of the uh, forthcoming events. We've got two which are focused on hydrogen, uh, one on uh, the bigger picture upstream hydrogen and one on different types of hydrogen energy storage that can be used in, in modular systems. So uh, I hope that you'll be able to join me for some of those hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen, let's hope is, is part of our energy future. Uh, so we're, I'm very excited about those coming up. But for today, um, we are going to, there we go. Um, we're going to be hearing from Alex Evans. Um, Alex Evans is the founder of the Collective Psychology Project. And I do advise you after this uh, to look at his website and the report that he and his colleagues have put together in this space, which I think is really well targeted and thought provoking. And I'm sure you'll get that sense from Alex today. As you can see, um, he, he holds a role at, at NYU uh, and previously was a, a campaign director. Uh, so he will perhaps explain a little bit of how he got from where he was then to where he is now. And he's going to talk to us, obviously, about the, the psychology of dealing with the climate crisis. And I think this is an area which is often overlooked in our discussions. We get quickly focused on technological solutions uh, and forget about the human part of this and the changes that we will necessarily face in our relationship to the planet and our relationship to each other going forward. So I'm going to ask Alex to talk us through that. Uh, as always, there will be plenty of time for questions at the end. Please do send those in and uh, please fire away now, Alex. Thank you. Thanks so much, Azim Diana. Great to be here and um, much appreciate the invitation to join you today. Can I check that my uh, slides are now visible on the screen? Azim, maybe you could give me a thumbs up if you can see those. Great, okay, super. So as Diana set up, I'm gonna talk today about the Collective Psychology Project, which is a startup that's been running for about a year and a half. And really what, this, what the project is about is the links and feedback loops between our states of mind on one hand and the state of the world on the other and also about how we can use psychology to overcome the polarization and tribalism that increasingly bedevils our politics and prompt more of us to see ourselves as part of a larger us rather than a them and us or just an atomized I. And I'll talk as I go through the slides about what this means for climate change in particular on this 50th anniversary Earth Day, but I'll also touch as I go on what it means for coronavirus, given that we're all living through lockdown. So first of all, um, let me tell the story of how the project came to start. Um, I first came up with the idea about two years ago, back when I was a campaign director at Avaaz. 
And one of my jobs at Avaaz, which if you don't know it is a 50 million member global citizens movement, was running Avaaz's Brexit campaign, which was fighting for Britain to stay in the European Union. And it was a lot of fun to, to work on that, but I felt this increasing sense of unease as time went by that perhaps I was part of the problem rather than part of the solution on Brexit. Because of course it was hard to avoid noticing this huge polarization that had erupted in our politics in Britain around Brexit, which came to feel less like a conventional political issue and more like a sort of septic wound that was just dripping toxin into our public debate. This here on this slide is a map of Twitter accounts on the Democrat and Republican side of the divide in the US and showing how they kind of are clustered into these two self-referential blobs. And of course, it's a very similar story with Brexit in the UK. And what I became especially interested in was the psychology of this, because if you've looked at the literature on political polarization, you'll know that there's a big debate that rages back and forth about whether this is mainly about politics, about people feeling alienated from elites or that they're all corrupt, or whether it's about economics, inequality, the 99% feeling left behind from the 1% and so forth. But I became really interested in the psychology and how we construe this in our minds. And in particular, how we make sense of threats. Because when I took a, a sabbatical after leaving of ours, um, I ended up living in Jerusalem and was fascinated to see how the very extreme polarization there between Israelis and Palestinians had its roots in the endemic nature of what's called continuous traumatic stress, the way that Israelis and Palestinians were living in a kind of constant low level state of threat perception and how the classic symptoms that comes with are things like anxiety, irritability, hypervigilance, where you're constantly scanning the environment for threats, and in particular, a propensity towards othering, towards kind of blaming some idealized scapegoat for all of society's ills. And as I saw that playing out between Israelis and Palestinians, I thought this reminds me so much of some of the dynamics we see with Brexit, um, with America under Trump. And it felt like a very underexplored aspect of political polarization. So when I came back from my sabbatical, I started digging into the polling data. And sure enough, this whole theme of threat perception was there in neon lights, both in why the Brexit referendum had gone the way it did and uh, the 2016 election in the United States. If you go back to that election campaign between Trump and Clinton, one of the single strongest predictors on whether someone was going to vote for Trump was agreement with the statement that quotes, the American way of life is threatened. And if you look in Britain at the same time, actually a majority of British people agreed with the statement that Britain increasingly feels like a foreign country and that makes me feel uncomfortable. And by the way, I don't mean to imply that all of this threat perception is just on the side of people who voted for Trump or voted to leave the EU. Because speaking as an ardent Remainer, I also woke up the morning after the referendum feeling like I lived in a foreign country. And of course, this is part of what's so interesting about the psychology of threat perception in a political context, that it can very easily become contagious. That as people at one end of the political spectrum become threatened and start acting accordingly, then that's threatening in its turn to people at the other end of the political spectrum. Well, so what? I mean, so we know that political polarization is a big deal and maybe it has psychological determinants. Why should we care about that? Well, I think there's three reasons that really stand out. The first one is because this poses a danger to the health of our democracy. This graph here from the hedge fund Bridgewater Associates charts 29 different countries and how authoritarian populism has waxed and waned, or rather how support for it has waxed and waned over the years in polling data. And as you can see, you have this enormous spike through the 30s uh, and up in particular to the advent of World War II. And then things settle down again. But after the financial crisis, we see another spike up to those levels that we saw in the 30s. And that's something that should concern everybody. The second reason why it's worth worrying about polarization is because of climate change. George Marshall, the great writer on public opinion and climate change, has this wonderful observation that the thing with climate is it's just too big an issue to be overcome without pretty much total commitment across society. But actually what we see most extremely, of course, in America is that climate change has become extremely polarized. In the US, it's now the single most polarized issue, more than capital punishment, 
or gun control or abortion. And as, as is very clear in the US, the issue once you have that degree of polarization is that it becomes pretty much impossible to assemble political coalitions for the really transformational action that's needed. But there's one other reason why I think it's worth worrying about polarization, and that's because it makes us unhappy. It makes us anxious and fearful. It doubles down that sense of threat perception that creates polarization uh, in the first place. And then you get this sort of feedback loop. And I wanna dig into this, this feedback loop between our states of mind and the state of the world. Let's take an example of how our states of mind can affect the state of the world. If you look at shopping, which has been called the single universal ritual that we all share, and is the basis, of course, of our unsustainable consumption patterns, there's lots of evidence from people like the Center for Environmental Strategy at Surrey University to explore that this is actually rooted in how we feel. So when we're anxious or when we're lo lonely or when we're perhaps feeling low self-worth, we very often go shopping as a way of kind of soothing that internal issue that's happening. And if that sounds like a slightly abstract observation, then of course the real world consequences of that overconsumption are anything but uh, abstract. On the contrary, they're extremely tangible. So that's an example of how things that begin in our states of mind can end up affecting the state of the world. And of course, where this gets really interesting is when it starts to play out in the political context. Here's Alexander Nix, the chief executive of Cambridge Analytica. And what Nix and his crew were able to do so effectively was use a sort of a mashup of psychological profiling assembled through questionnaires that had been done on Facebook, together with social media micro-targeting of political advertising, in effect to kind of weaponize our own anxieties against us, to press our buttons pretty much individually with a very high degree of precision just when it mattered most during election time, to get a critical mass of us to see the world in them and us terms and thereby affect the outcomes of an election. So again, this is an example of how our states of mind affect the state of the world. And in turn, the state of the world affects our state of mind. And as I'll come on to in a moment, this is really, really relevant as it turns out for our current situation as we grapple, coronavirus, grapple with coronavirus. But just to finish the story of how the Collective Psychology Project came into being, when I got back from my sabbatical, I took about nine months to do an inquiry into what we can learn from psychology in the world of politics and campaigning and media and so forth. And after the nine months of talking to about 200 psychologists and psychotherapists and other people who in different ways deal with our inner worlds, I wrote this report called A Larger Us, which came out last summer. And I'll just walk in the rest of this presentation through some of the headline findings from that report and what they mean for both climate change and coronavirus. So let's start with what success looks like, where we're trying to get to. And I've already given you the punchline. I think one version of success is when we think of ourselves as part of a larger us rather than part of a polarized them and us that's at each other's throats or as an atomized I, as a sort of island on our own. This stuff is obviously super relevant to climate change. It's relevant to our own individual consumption decisions, for example. Every time we decide whether we're going to take a train or a plane or whether we're going to order a burger or something vegan, we're making decisions about whether to operate and see ourselves as part of just an I, where our actions don't matter, or as part of a global us, where we recognize the ripple effects that our individual decisions have. And of course, the same question arises at things like multilateral summits. So you can see here Greta Thunberg looking balefully at Donald Trump. And countries face these decisions too. Every time the UN has a climate summit, are countries going to act in the interests of a larger us, or are they going to polarize into a them and us, or just free ride on the actions of other, others in a sort of atomized I dynamic? And this stuff is really relevant for coronavirus too. And just to give three examples of that, we saw a month ago a spate of panic buying in multiple countries with people kind of cleaning out everything on the shelves, acting very much on the basis of an atomized eye and not looking to the larger us dynamics. Similarly, when we make our individual decisions about social distancing, about whether to respect social distancing protocols or just conclude, well, I'm young enough that the symptoms probably won't matter too much for me. I think I'm just going to ignore it. 
again, we're taking decisions about whether to align ourselves and see ourselves as part of a larger us or not. And again, at intergovernmental level, we can see now lots of governments sliding into a them and us dynamic just when we need them to cohere into a larger us dynamic. So when you have Trump calling it a Chinese virus, or indeed parts of the Chinese government saying that coronavirus was cooked up in a US Army laboratory, what we're seeing is them and us thinking. Now, the second aspect of what success looks like is about how we respond to threats. Everyone's heard of the fight or flight response, or more specifically, the fight, flight, freeze response to perceived threats. And this is a physiological way of responding to threats that's really kind of hardwired into us. We all know what that feels like. Your pulse begins to go faster. You'll start to sweat a little bit, and you can feel the adrenaline coursing down your arms. And in terms of you know, being prepared for the possibility that someone may physically attack you, fight or flight is an extremely useful response. When we're dealing with a collective threat, something like climate change or coronavirus, this is a much less useful kind of response because fight or flight is all about protecting the individual. It's not that interested in the interests of the collective. When we're in a fight or flight kind of defensive crouch or ready to fight with someone, it's when we're at our least empathetic. And it's also, there's some data to suggest, when we're most vulnerable to extremist views. But this is not a helpful way of responding to collective threats. But psychologists also talk about a different kind of threat response that we can reach for if we know how to do it. And that's the one that they call tend and befriend. Tend and befriend is behavioral rather than physiological. And if you wanna see an example of what it looks like, then a really good place to look is the aftermath of natural disasters. The myth is that after a big natural disaster like a hurricane or an earthquake, we see a breakdown of law and order, there's mass looting, you have to declare martial law. That's completely opposite to what actually happens in the aftermath of most natural disasters. Instead, what we typically see is a tremendous outpouring of selflessness, solidarity, of kind of pulling together. And that is what tend and befriend looks like in action. It's when we tend to ourselves and our immediate family group, and we befriend others, we build social networks that help us to do that tending. This is way more pro-social. It's interested in the good of the collective rather than just the individual. It sees our interdependence with each other as a source of strength rather than a source of vulnerability. If we can respond to threats by going into tend and befriend rather than fight or flight, we're much more likely to be able to see ourselves as part of a larger us rather than a them and us or an atomized I. So what are the things that determine whether we go into tend and befriend and see ourselves as part of a larger us when we're in conditions of crisis and when we're faced with scary issues like climate change and coronavirus? Well, at the Collective Psychology Project, we use this framework that we call ABC to talk about this. And they stand for agency, belonging, and conscious self-awareness. And I'll say a little bit about each of those. Just to keep you on your toes, I'll start with C, conscious self-awareness. And this one's really about whether we have the presence of mind to be able to choose how to respond to the stuff that we come across in our lives, especially the threatening things, rather than our amygdala, the part of our brain that deals with threats, taking us straight into that defensive crouch of fight or flight. Now, in the climate context, this is starting to play out in some really interesting ways uh, in kind of future activism. If you look at Extinction Rebellion in the UK, for example, there's an enormous amount of emphasis placed on what's called regenerative culture. And what this emphasizes is both self-care, looking after ourselves so that we avoid the problem of burnout that is so common among activists and organizers, but there's also a tremendous premium on empathy, on de-escalating kind of tense moments of protests rather than ramping up the heat, of refusing to kind of shame people who may disagree with us, instead trying to get into their shoes and climb into their worldview and understand how they may see it. And Extinction Rebellion does a ton of training on this stuff. It doesn't always work as we saw in the Canning Town protests that happened last year, but the intention is there to create a different sort of culture for activism. Now, this is also really, really relevant to coronavirus. 
Part of what I think is so fascinating about this moment um, is an observation that Azim made in a recent edition of Exponential View when he observed that this is a point where our master narratives are breaking down. It's something that doesn't happen all that often. I mean, it happened with the fall of the Berlin Wall or 9-11 or the financial crisis. It's one of those moments when all the things we thought we could rely on start to break down and we're not sure what we can take for granted anymore. So we're looking around for new stories to make sense of what's happening. And in conditions like these, when there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of confusion, it's very easy for our states of mind to be infectious. Things like panic or fear can ripple through our collective central nervous system on social media very, very quickly, just like a murmuration of starlings changes direction in this incredibly fluid sort of way. So in those conditions, being able to manage our mental and emotional states becomes especially important so that we can play our part in helping to maintain a healthy state in that collective central nervous system rather than let it slip into panic. But that starts with taking care of ourselves, with knowing what we can do individually in our own lives to kind of manage our mental and emotional states. But it also becomes super important when we interact on social media. So if you look at this sort of conspiracy theories and fake news doing the rounds at the moment. Again, it's about, do we have the conscious self-awareness to stop and think, is this for real? Is this actually based on evidence or am I being trolled here? And then take appropriate action on that basis. So a lot depends on whether we have this conscious self-awareness, this presence of mind. The second part of ABC is about belonging. Now, we all know that loneliness is, one of, uh, is another epidemic that we face at this point uh, in contemporary life. It's uh, terrible in terms of its public health impacts. It's actually as bad for your life expectancy as smoking 15 cigarettes a day by some estimations. But we also know that when people feel lonely and disconnected, that's ground zero for a whole ton of political problems. Because when people are alone, they're less empathetic, they're more vulnerable to extremism. Every time we see some dreadful mass shooting event take place, it's almost invariably a lonely man. So in all sorts of ways, from that extreme example down to the much more kind of modest examples of just everyday life, it matters that we feel that we belong and are connected to our communities. This stuff is especially important in the context of climate change. One of the things that fascinates me about successful activist models on climate change is how many of them are built around small groups that are very, very rich in these dense networks of belonging. So when you look at school strikers, or when you look at the local affinity groups that Extinction Rebellion's built out of, or when you look at something like 350.org in the United States, which is built around small groups on college campuses, it's that sense of belonging, of seeing the same faces over and over, that's one of the most important kinds of glue that makes a political movement cohere for the long term. And now as we grapple with coronavirus, that sense of belonging is especially important as well, because of course, now we can't gather, we can't occupy the same space together. And for people who already live on their own, especially old people, this has a tremendous mental health impact. So it really matters that we create new forms of belonging, of kind of networks of connection that can still work uh, even in conditions of lockdown, which is why things like, like you see on the slide here, these kind of self-organized community initiatives to create that belonging are so important. It's not just that they're helping us with our mental health and especially helping the most lonely and vulnerable people with theirs, but we're also in the process creating bandwidth to thinking of ourselves as a larger us rather than lapsing into the kind of them and us or atomized I that may become prevalent when we feel disconnected. So that's B for belonging. And third and finally, a word about A for agency. And by agency, I really am talking about power. Do we feel like we have power in our own lives to shape uh, the course of our futures or in our workplaces? Do we feel like we have power in our communities and in our national politics? And unfortunately, at the moment, one of the things that we know is that very often people feel powerless. They feel powerless because they lack autonomy at work, for example. Or people may feel powerless in communities when they see their local shops or post offices or pubs kind of evaporating before their eyes and feeling there's nothing they can do about it. And of course, when you're faced with really big issues, things like Brexit, or climate change or coronavirus, 
that sense of losing agency may be particularly acute. And going back once again to climate activism, I think some of the most interesting and exciting models of activism that we see at the moment are the ones that really focus on giving activists a sense of agency, of putting them in the driving seat of campaigns rather than regarding them as mere pawns to be deployed to get them to kind of click sign on a petition or send a postcard to their legislator or give five pounds a month or whatever it may be. And one of the best examples of this is Friends of the Earth's network of local climate action groups. Uh, groups, which has exploded almost out of nothing over the last two years, and now has more of those local groups than Extinction Rebellion has local groups. And a lot of the reason for that is because so much agency is devolved down to these groups. It's very much up to them what they campaign on, what their priorities will be. And this theme of agency is also, again, really, really important in the coronavirus context. I mentioned panic buying earlier. And of course, one of the things that people are doing when they're filling up their trolleys with as much stuff as they can, when they go into that bunker mentality, is they're looking for a sense of agency. They're looking for the ability to kind of take control of their circumstances rather than just be swept along by events. But of course, for that to be pro-social, for it to move out of fight or flight and into tend and befriend, it can't just be about the household level. It can't be just about safety in our individual bunkers, which isn't really a form of safety at all. And that's why when we see things like the flourishing of COVID mutual aid groups that are springing up, not just in the UK, but all over the world, this is an incredibly helpful kind of agency. It's something that gives people a sense of how they can make a positive contribution and get involved in being part of the solution. But the really big question lurking in the background is one that's at a higher level again than the hyper-local level that COVID mutual aid groups occupy. And that's really about seizing the potential of this transformational political moment. As we've seen, so much has been turned upside down just in the space of a month. And so many things that were politically unthinkable a month ago have suddenly become reality, whether it's governments committing to find places for um, all homeless people to live, or whether it's the extraordinary way that states have seized back the commanding heights of the economy uh, and mounted bailouts on a scale absolutely unprecedented in modern times. But as we've seen, there are all kinds of profound inequalities and injustices that are also arising with coronavirus, just as with climate change more broadly. And so in order to seize this transformational moment and make sure that we both protect people who are vulnerable and use the potential of this moment, for good, it's going to be necessary to build a kind of a political movement which can work even in conditions of lockdown when we're unable to physically gather. So that's the real test for us in terms of agency over the weeks and months ahead. I'm going to wrap up there um, and be very happy to take questions, but thanks so much again for the invitation to present today and uh, great to be with you all. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, I'm going to give Azim the first question and then I will uh, take over and so I would encourage other people to type their questions in the Q&A window, please. Yes, thank you so much, Alex, and uh, thank you, uh, Diana, for, for letting me have the first uh, shot at this. Uh, that was uh, fascinating. It's great at times like this to have a, a sort of a sense of a positive roadmap. Um, I'm curious about uh, about one thing. So back in uh, in 1985, at the height of the Cold War, uh, Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev were over in Iceland, uh, and, and the, the apocryphal story is that. The reason they got to a detente was uh, because of this, this conversation, which went uh, something like this, that Reagan said to uh, President Gorbachev, what would you do if the United States were attacked by someone from outer space? Would you, would you help us? And Gorbachev replies, ah, well, no doubt about it. And after some laughter, uh, we started a process that led to, for many years, that sort of the de-escalation of the tension um, that had loomed over us as a real and um, present threat. Um, now, I find it curious that um, we've, we face currently two um, alien scale threats uh, to us. One is the, the climate change one, which has been bubbling along for you know, decades. And the second is this threat from you know, 120 nanometers uh, of virus. And, and yet 
we don't seem to have responded the way Gorbachev suggested we might have done. Um, and I'm curious about why you think that is and the extent to which we are reliant on the people who have followed in the footsteps of Gorbachev and Reagan to take that enlightened view in order to move things forward. Thanks. Thanks, Azine. That's a great question. I guess, I mean, it's a really interesting one. One of my favorite books is a book called Non-Zero by Robert Wright, which is a kind of very long arc history of human cooperation. And one of the observations he makes is that over the millennia, we've cooperated and collaborated at higher and higher levels of complexity. So we start out as kind of nomadic bands of hunter-gatherers, and we fast forward a little bit, and then we're in settled chiefdoms or kingdoms. A bit further, it might be city-states, all the way up through nation-states and today's global diasporas. And now here we are right on the verge of seeing ourselves as part of an us that includes not just all 7.8 billion of us humans, but also generations that haven't been born yet, and indeed other species too. That's the kind of, you know, the breakthrough liminal threshold that we're right on the edge of. But as you say in your question, we're not there yet. Um, and I think that, you know, what this could basically go either way. We could break through, um, faced with this kind of twin set of crises, through to a sort of much higher level of coherence and ability to act collectively. Or we might slide into a breakdown scenario where we fragment, we end up uh, fighting each other. And in effect, the, the level of coherence breaks down to a whole lot of smaller levels, which would be absolutely catastrophic given the extent of current global interdependence. And I think part of the reason that although we have these shared threats, that it hasn't yet taken us over that threshold towards the kind of breakthrough scenario is because they're not external threats. I mean, if we were faced with alien invasion, that would activate a very kind of deep human instinct to band together and fight a, a kind of common adversary. And of course, you know, in history, exactly that kind of stimulus has constantly prompted more non-zero sum cooperation between you know, allies in conflict. But when you look at something like climate change, in fact, it's not, I mean, as much as we might like to blame it on some adversary like Exxon or the Koch brothers or Saudi Arabia or whoever it may be, in fact, we're all complicit in creating that problem, both in our lifestyles and also in the extent of political space that we do or don't cede to policymakers. And in that sense, in psychological terms, it's what Carl Jung would call an issue to do with our shadow. It's to do with stuff that we're kind of pushing out of our conscious awareness because we don't want to be aware of it. And then it comes back and bites us in all sorts of ways. And so for Jung, the thing was that you have to bring this stuff into conscious awareness um, and integrate it. And that's really what we have to do with things like climate change, that you, know, you can't just blame it on someone else. It does require us to acknowledge our, you know, the fact that we're all culpable in this and be willing to change our own lifestyles rather than just say, this is about litigation against oil companies or, or whatever it may be. But it is you know, clearly much more of a challenge to address a threat that originates at least in part in ourselves. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Diana. Uh, thank you so much, Alex. I want to follow up a little bit on that aspect and think about the link that with your discussion of agency really. Um, at the moment, as you say, we have a climate crisis in which we're all somewhat complicit. We're all also, or many of us, are also what uh, Jonathan Rowson called uh, closet climate deniers in, a, in as much as we don't take the actions required uh, to make amends on the climate front, we, we believe, but we don't do much about it. And I'm just wondering, um, with something very big like climate, we can feel that we're all in it together, but we can also still feel, as you alluded to in your presentation, extremely powerless. Uh, and you know, the people often refer to, it doesn't matter what I do because look what they're doing in China and those kind of things. So how do we create a narrative, particularly around the climate space that, that helps encourage people to do their bit and also license those who can do more, i.e. politicians and, and big corporations to do their bit, which will make an even greater difference? Yeah, great question. So I think, I mean, I, 
there's probably two sides of an answer to that. I mean, one is, as you imply, Diana, about our own individual consumption decisions, which are part of what makes us complicit. I used to be quite skeptical of the idea that, you know, actually our individual decisions mattered that much, because there's lots of evidence that when you look at so-called ethical consumerism, things like organic food or socially responsible pensions, it doesn't, um, you know, typically go that far beyond a sort of niche of people who are willing to pay more for ethical products. And so, you know, I rather cynically looked at that and thought, well, this isn't a game changer. This isn't where real transformation is going to come from in the economy. That's all about politics. But I've come to think over time that actually, when you're looking at things like movement building, those individual consumption decisions and lifestyle decisions do matter because in some more subtle way than you know, the admittedly very small environmental impact when you look at the bigger picture, they're important as an indicator of the kind of quality of our intention, um, that actually it's very difficult to talk the talk politically unless you're also walking the walk. And that applies uh, very much to, you know, I mean, I, I've been involved in Extinction Rebellion and have been aware of kind of inconsistencies about, um, you know, am I really living out the values that I preach as an activist? So I think that's part of it. And so I've come to see that, you know, actually probably individual decisions matter a lot more than I'd realized, partly because of that psychological factor. But ultimately, I think really that sense of agency comes from politics. And this is where we've got this kind of crisis with how our democracies work because people feel alienated and elections become largely about how really quite a small uh, cohort of swing voters decide so that many people are not being totally irrational when they conclude that their vote doesn't count for very much. And that's why I think that creating um, you know, both opportunities for um, participation matters a lot. So when you look at how, for example, there's been a citizens assembly on climate change here in the UK, that is something that I think can create much more of a sense of um, ownership if government is responsible, uh, responsive to those sorts of forum. But ultimately, you know, this is also about organizing and movement building, which is why I think that things like Extinction Rebellion, which has made so much running on climate change, are important to take advantage of political moments. The needle has moved so much on public opinion on climate change in just the last couple of years. That's not all down to movements like Extinction Rebellion or Sunrise in the US. It's also because of the impacts that we're seeing, like the wildfires in Australia and the Amazon or melting sea ice and so forth. But in terms of seizing the political potential of those moments, um, those movements are really, really important because they show that things are happening, that the Overton window of what's politically possible is shifting. And of course, as I, as I mentioned in the presentation, they give people a chance to participate in and be part of that. Fine, I'll mute myself. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, you're absolutely right. And I think that links to another question, which is around linking the current crisis uh, and the opportunity for climate that might come out of that, that might come out of the discontinuity. We have a question here from Peter Moore, who says he works in local government on climate policy, and he was feeling quite gloomy uh, four weeks ago. He now feels more positive, and he's asking whether he has the right to feel more optimistic and how we can really ensure that we will build back better uh, and uh, what kind of stories, I guess, and, and approaches will help us make best use of this crisis. Wow, that's a, that's a great question. Well, I think that, um, I mean, to start on a sobering note, I think that the, the field of disaster sociology about how people behave in disasters, which is one that's always fascinated me, is quite sobering on what we should expect uh, in terms of morale over the next weeks and months. So I think what we've been seeing over the last month is a classic case of the so-called honeymoon period that often happens in the wake of a disaster. And that's when people feel um, a sense of cohesion, that everyone's coming together, that together we can beat this, uh, this situation. And people actually feel quite a high sense of agency. And so when you look at things like COVID mutual aid groups or the huge number of volunteers for the UK government's NHS volunteers initiative, I think that's part of what you're seeing. But what disaster sociology also says is that after that initial honeymoon period, you get into a fairly long lasting period of disillusionment where people start to realize the limits 
of um, responses um, and what can be achieved through through kind of you know self-organized action people start to internalize the fact that you know not everything is going to go back uh, to how it was before and we often find that multiple stresses really start pressing in and taking their toll at that point and um, people are exhausted there's a lack of time financial pressures are weighing um, we may be dealing with physical health issues so often there's a sort of pronounced downturn in morale after that initial honeymoon period. And although that's ultimately followed by a so-called recovery period, when people get back a sense of agency and they find uh, a sense of purpose and perhaps also of meaning in what's happened, that may take weeks or months to materialize. Now I say this not, not in the sense of being deterministic, um, because as I said, I mean, you know, if we have conscious self-awareness, the whole gift of that is that we can choose how to respond to stuff rather than you know have this decision made for us automatically by our threat response system but i think that being forewarned about the possibility of a kind of dip at that moment of or period of disillusionment means that we can steel ourselves for it we can kind of prepare ourselves mentally um, and you know build up our resilience before it starts kicking in with that said, um, I also think that you know where, where I agree with Peter and feel some of that sense of optimism myself is that this is a moment where the kind of Overton window is just wide open for transformational action. I think lots of people um, who are like me on the progressive end of politics felt a sense of frustration that we didn't make better use of the financial crisis 10 years ago as a moment when you know so much was possible. We weren't ready for it. And, I've always been inspired by that quote of Milton Friedman's um, over on the kind of, you know, right wing of politics who observed that only a crisis actual or perceived produces real change. When that crisis happens, uh, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. And I think at this point, you know, we've got a lot of great ideas that are lying around and that are sort of closer to political feasibility than I've ever seen them. Just to take one example, universal basic income has been kicking around as a sort of interesting theoretical idea uh, for some years now. But I think we're you know, closer than I've ever seen to that being implemented or things like that being implemented in multiple countries. And on climate, um, I think that you know, there's actually the potential of something really, really exciting to happen next year. Like a lot of us, I felt very dispirited early this year before COVID-19 at how badly the UK government seemed to be fumbling uh, its presidency of the COP that was due to pl take place in Glasgow at the end of this year. Kind of, you know, really didn't have its ducks in a row, even on something as basic as who was supposed to be coordinating preparations for that. But actually, now that coronavirus has forced the delay of that COP until next year, we have this incredibly interesting and unusual alignment of the planets, if you like, in that the two countries who are the co-presidents of the climate summit, that's to say the UK and Italy, are also the two countries that are gonna be chairing the G7 and the G20 in the same year. Now, I, I can't recall ever seeing anything like that on climate summitry. And if we can get our ducks in a row and really seize that moment, then you know, a huge amount could fall into place. And I think you know, there's also so much organizing happening, which is why I, emphasized at the end of the presentation, the need to really crack on with a kind of movement building across multiple issues so that rather than just having a climate movement uh, or a human rights movement or a refugee rights movement, we really bring that together into a coherent overall agenda. And I think that may be starting to happen. So um, although we should expect our morale to encounter headwinds as we realize that, you know, things aren't going back to normal anytime soon, and also see the different layers of the crisis, not just public health, but also economic uh, and then socio-political. Nevertheless, there's a lot we can do uh, if we come together in a larger us way, rather than letting ourselves fragment into a them and us. Alex, I've got lots of questions and I'm gonna rapid fire them at you. So I'm gonna ask you to right. be, try and be I'll a be little sure. bit brief. Yep. Uh, linking to what you just said about coming together, um, there's, there's a question in about crystallizing points online. Do you think, do you think do you recognize uh, places where people are coming together virtually to join causes of different sorts? Yes, very much, but mainly in the local sense. I mean, I think one of the things that's fascinating is how bottom-up self-organized systems are making all the running at this point. And it's happening through Google Docs and Slack channels and um, kind of, you know, Zoom calls and so forth. 
Whereas when we see attempts to do the same thing through, through top-down centralized responses, they're much, much slower. Look at how NHS volunteers got three quarters of a million signups, and it hasn't managed to allocate tasks to those people. So I think that the crystallizing is absolutely happening online, but it's still very local. And the next challenge is the one that you identify is how do we connect the dots between those local initiatives so that there's coordination, but also learning and ways of funneling money down to these kind of local groups. Uh, and at that point, you have a truly extraordinary political movement that's up and running, but we've got to connect the dots. Yes, there's, you know, it's good that we've started, but we have a long way to go. On, on, on the storytelling and communications around the climate area specifically, mm. you know, there's been a long running tension between the, the, the sort of catastrophists and, the, and the, well, the pessimists and then the more optimists, obviously Christiana Figueres in that camp. And, you know, yes, we can approach uh, and a lot of tension as to which creates the most change. Given mm. where, where we are now, uh, and as you say, with the COP delayed, with this perhaps greater opportunity, how can we talk about climate better to uh, instigate more action and, and sort of paper, yeah. paper over the polarization, but you know, get over polarization. And just before I pass it over to you, someone's referred to uh, whether we should um, talk in more religious terms uh, uh, about these things to try and bring more people on site, particularly in the, in, in the US. And I know that that issue of religion is one that's come up in your work. So I'll just put those, that yeah. question to you. Well, actually, I mean, I think, so I've just finished writing with uh, my colleagues, Casper Takayal and Ivor Williams, um, a paper about collective grief and how we deal with it, both in the context of climate change and now in the context of COVID-19. And one of the things we talk about in that paper is that actually we have, you know, although we think this is an unprecedented crisis and we don't have maps on how to navigate it, our ancestors have dealt with crises like cataclysms like this lots of times before. And they have lots to teach us, as it turns out, particularly in uh, myths, the kind of kind of very deep shared stories that explain where we are, how we got here, where we might be trying to get to, who we are underneath it all, and that also hold up a mirror to you know sides of ourselves that we might not want to look at. And I think if you look at cataclysms in the past and the kinds of myths that have emerged, one of the things that's interesting is to look at the sorts of roles that myths have played. And the theologian Walter Brugman talks about these three roles of reality, grief, and hope as being especially important um, during cataclysm. So reality is just like, you know, be unflinching about facing up to what is happening, why it's happening, and how serious it is. Second, the grief part is it's absolutely necessary and appropriate to grieve for what has been lost, not just for the people that we're losing, but also the passing of a way of life. And then once you go through the grief, it's in the grief almost as it kind of reconnects us, that we can start to find the seeds of new hope, even amid the ashes of the old. And I think that, you know, you can start to see that coming together in the climate movement. I mean, five years ago, nobody was talking about grief. It was this quite weird thing that we all worked on this tremendously scary issue involving huge amounts of loss. Nobody ever really acknowledged any sense of grief to themselves, much less expressing it. But now that's really changed. There's lots of expression of grief in the climate movement. I mean, you see it with uh, Extinction Rebellion does grief tending workshops at, process, uh, at protests. You see Greta Thunberg really giving vent to emotion. You see funerals being held for glaciers in places like Iceland and Switzerland. And that's great. There's raw emotional power in that. But I think the, the trick is you mustn't get stuck in the grief. I mean, that becomes a recipe very quickly for fatalism and depression and apathy and just kind of, you know, lying down and waiting, waiting for death almost. And that's not where we need to be. We need to come through the grief and look for the new hope. Um, and I think that, you know, when you look at the myths our ancestors used to make sense of cataclysm, you often see all of those elements there. And in modern times, if you look at Churchill's finest hour speech, it's there as well, unflinching in the estimation of just how serious the situation is. Um, you know, very much attending to what's been lost and to the sort of people that have been lost, but ultimately very energizing in its vision, both of what we're capable of, that even a thousand years from now, people will say this was their finest hour, and with the vision of the city on the hill, of the kind of broad sunlit uplands, as he put it, um, that, it, you know, is where we're trying to get to. But, you know, there's no point just having hope without sort of being honest about both how bad things are and about you know, the pain of the loss we're experiencing. You must have all three.
But in terms of inserting the climate uh, into our economic plans for the future, I've spoken to a number of people who've sensed a great tension between you know, putting climate conditionality around stimulus packages and feeling that that will really irritate people and uh, push climate off the agenda for good so that it, it needs to be a very delicate stage process Nonetheless, I think the danger with that is that we, we, it just becomes an option that we, is kind of tacked on at the end and, and isn't core to the growth that we wish to see going forward. So any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the starting point would be that if you look at the economic impacts we're already seeing as a result of the virus, they're so directly relevant to climate change, whether you look at the way the airline sector has just imploded, um, or the you know, WTI oil prices actually went negative this week and are going to wipe out a whole lot of high cost um, you know, shale based producers in the United States. This stuff is going to change our energy economy. And so in that sense, you know, this isn't something that, you know, um, there's no option of going back to normal, whatever happens. I mean, lots and lots of jobs have been lost forever. Uh, lots of industries or businesses um, you know, are going to have permanent scars as a result of this. So it's not so much that, you know, the default course is that we go back to the status quo ante, but we could sort of tack on as an afterthought, let's try and do it a bit greener. It's more like this is a control or delete moment, um, you know, in all kinds of ways. And we have all kinds of choices about how to come back. So, I mean, I agree with you that, you know, it, framing this as a conditionality, as strings attached or, you know, extra sources of stress for people when they're on the ropes already would be tremendously unhelpful. But if we frame this as, you know, the the governments have, as I say, reclaimed the commanding heights of the economy. Huge decisions are now being made in real time about which sectors to support and what kinds of support to offer. There's just, these are creative choices rather than conditionalities, but they're very much shaped by the stories that we reach for to understand what's going on. I mean, when you look at panic buying or a run on a bank, what is that but a, a story that there isn't enough to go around that then shapes how people behave and then becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I think all of this starts with getting the narrative right about this moment. Uh, and then that creates much more auspicious conditions for political movements and advocacy and so forth to influence those political choices. One of the interesting things I know about your work is, is around campaigning with uh, NGOs and trying to help them campaign in a, in a larger us way. And as I understand it, one of your pieces of advice is to not have a kind of bogeyman out there, an enemy that, that is, is immediately quite valuable, but, but obviously creates greater polarization. I think what's interesting now is that kind of COVID, we all have a clear enemy. You know, globally, there is an enemy uh, and we're all feeling good that we're on the same side against it and that we might pull together. Like, that's not the case for climate. Um, there isn't one discernible enemy. How do you think that your, the way you're approaching stuff can be effective given the absence of an enemy um it, you know across those two different types of, of of crisis i guess yeah well i mean i think that in in both covid and climate change there is very much the risk of a lapse into them and us thinking i mean what, what you just said out there diana was you know a beautiful illustration of how you're a member of the larger us tribe in saying you know we have we're unified in the face of a common enemy like covid but of course you know we're seeing lots of governments position themselves for a blame game. Um, you know, I mean, whether you know, they're blaming China for hushing up the extent of the outbreak to begin with, or Trump blaming the WHO, or China blaming the US. I mean, there's lots and lots of uh, governments and other kinds of actors who are seeing each other or framing each other as the enemy. Um, and similarly on climate change, you know, I, I have seen so many UN summits kind of just you know, sagging under the weight of these them and us dynamics between you know, uh, developed and developing countries or different negotiating blocks. So that, that hazard is absolutely there. In the campaigning context, as you say, um, you know, we're very interested at the project in this idea of larger us campaigning because one of the things that's always struck me is if you start out as a rookie campaigner at Oxfam or Greenpeace, you know, perhaps in your early 20s, pretty much the first thing you're gonna learn is never underestimate the power of a really good baddie to fire up your campaigns. And of course, that you know, if you're looking at metrics like maximizing supporter engagement, getting some good media hits, um, you know, maximizing your fundraising, 
then those them and us framings work really well. I mean, it's just the same reason. If I want a tweet to go viral, I'm much more likely to get loads of retweets if I go into some furious spiel of outrage rather than, you know, say we ought to think of ourselves as part of a larger us. I mean, there's a reason that people like Facebook uh, push triggering content at us on, through their algorithms. It's because that's the best way of monetizing our attention. The problem is that when polarization is itself the enemy, when that's the thing that blocks us from where we need to get to on something like coronavirus or climate change, then that kind of them and us campaigning is part of the problem. You can't win with it. And I think that you know, when you look at lots of progressive activism, we have these really important dilemmas about are we just going to play to our political base and fire that base up in righteous fury and construe this as a challenge where what we've got to do is just crush the other side underfoot? Or are we going to try and do a different form of activism where we don't other op our opponents? And we're not just trying to fire up our base, but we're also trying to build bridges to people at the other side of the political spectrum. That seems to me like a more compelling theory of change. And I think some of the most exciting campaigns of recent years do exactly that. So when you look at how the equal marriage campaign in the United States used deep canvassing, really kind of literally going to the doorsteps of their most ardent political opponents and using listening and empathy to win them over, that's an example of larger us campaigning. Or when you see the rerun uh, Istanbul mayoral elections last year, and the way that the candidate for the secular CHP party made a point of reaching out to Erdogan's report, uh, support base, the kind of AKP voters, showing respect for their values, refusing to other them, uh, and then subsequently winning a landslide. That's an example of larger us campaigning. But those sorts of examples are still thin on the ground. And, you know, the incentives for NGOs or political parties do tend to favor the sort of shorter term sugar rush, if you like, of them and us campaigning. Um, but ultimately, to get where we need to get to, we need to embrace the larger us kind. We, we're out of time now. We've got really masses of questions, which I hope, Alex, you'll have an opportunity to look through. And I know that uh, you'd be very happy for people to, to, to get in contact with you directly and yeah, absolutely. Know more about the Collective Psychology Project. And I know you're, you're sponsoring uh, different approaches locally to building up uh, the the us versus um, I mean you know the, the larger us uh, approach. Yeah. One of the things that I just think is interesting about this crisis is is I was reading stuff yesterday about how obviously everyone wants to get back to normal and how normal mm. basically is defined as shopping uh, and retail right. therapy uh, and how we can strengthen ourselves to. Um, basically resist the massive onslaught of, of, of advertising, et cetera, to tell us that, that the only thing that will get us back to feeling good about life is if we can go out shopping again. Um, uh, so I think that having this time to reflect on uh, both the links between our personal and our collective psychology uh, and how we can have the, the awareness to stop and resist those things which are not good for us, and not good for the planet, I think is fantastic and very appropriate for Earth Day. So I'm really delighted you were able to be with us. Uh, I think there's a really rich vein of thinking. I'm glad you're working in the area and I would encourage people to be in touch with you directly. Great, well, thanks so much for the invitation to, to join you today. It's been um, really fun uh, to be part of the discussion. I'll uh, post some links on my Twitter feed, which is Alex Evans UK, uh, to some recent work that we've done at the project and that I've done with my colleague, David Stephen, um, on the political dimensions of coronavirus. Um, but for now, thanks so much again for the invitation to be here today. Thank you. And thanks to everyone for joining us, of course. Thanks so much, Alex and Diana. Bye-bye.